Hello everyone, it's me Jen from Team Tandem and I'm here with Karis Davis to talk about her new book Clear published by Granta. Hi Karis. Hi Jen, thanks for having me along. No, no problem at all. So I'm going to ask you some more kind of specific questions in a moment but I wonder if you could just tell me to start with a little bit about your novel Clear. Mm -hmm. So Clear is the story of Iva the last remaining inhabitant of a remote island off the far northeast coast of Scotland, beyond Shetland, and of John Ferguson, who's the impoverished, uh, newly married Presbyterian minister who sent up there to evict Ivor from his home. And it's also the story of Mary, John's wife, uh, left behind on the mainland and becoming increasingly anxious and convinced that her husband should never have gone on this errand. Brilliant. And just to, do you want me to get a little bit of uh, historical yeah, context? Yes, yeah, so, so the year is 1843, which means that we are in the last few most brutally coercive decades of the Highland clearances which had been going on since the middle of the previous century, which saw Scottish landowners clearing their estates of their poor, uh, small, unprofitable tenants to make way for sheep grazing. And this sheep frontier, if you like, has been moving steadily north. Um, and this is why Iva now is, is going to be evicted so that the island can be graze for sheep. And there's another big historical uh, upheaval in Scottish society that my three characters are embroiled with. And that's something called the Great Disruption, which happened in 1843. It was a split in the Scottish church where about a third of the ministers left to form the new free church. And in doing that, they became poor overnight. They lost their income, their, their living, their houses, their churches. So my John Ferguson is um, is very worried about money and he wants to be able to put a roof over his new wife's head. Um, and so when this opportunity through a family connection comes up uh, of uh, having this paid job to deliver a, an eviction notice on this remote island, he accepts it. Excellent. So. Actually, that slightly changes my question. I was going to ask, like the setting is incredible and beautiful and vivid and brutal and all these things. <laughs> going to ask kind of what made you settle on that location? But I suppose, did you settle on that location or did you know more that you wanted to write about these historical events, about the Highland clearances and then came to the location? No, no not, not at all. I never planned to write about the historical uh, that particular historical moment, the clearances, or and certainly not the, the great disruption. Um, what happened? This this story uh, actually grew across me stumbling upon an old dictionary. Um, I was in the library one day here in Edinburgh, uh, in the lovely reading room there, and uh, I was taking a break from work and browsing the shelves, and I found this two volume, two quite battered volumes of a hundred year old um, dictionary, more than a hundred year old dictionary. And it turned out to be the dictionary of a language I hadn't heard of, an extinct language called Norn, which used to be spoken on the islands of Orkney and Shetland mm -hmm. in the far north of Scotland, mm -hmm. but had begun to die out uh, way back in, um, in the, as, as early as the 15th century when the islands were pawned by the King of Denmark to mm -hmm. Scotland and the language was replaced by Scots. But anyway, I was completely enchanted by this language, this really rich language which spoke of a very particular place, hundreds of words to do with um, the, the, the sea and the sky and the weather and the, and the, and the ground. So it was really that, not that I decided I was going to locate a novel in this particular place, but um, these words, conjured a place and uh, I sort of lived with this dictionary for about 10 years dreaming about this island uh, until I could really see it you know like a film mm -hmm. and eventually I could see Ivor 
and I knew what I knew about him was that he was alone mm -hmm. and that he was probably the very last speaker of this vanishing language and there was a sort of atmosphere I think perhaps because the language was in danger there was always an atmosphere in my imagination of danger and and either sort of being on the brink of great difficulty um and I so I thought well if he's the last speaker of this language maybe this is somewhere possibly around the middle of the 19th century mm -hmm. so that that was what sort of dropped me into that moment in history and the clearances and I realized oh well, yeah the danger that Ivor is in is he's he's about to be evicted and then I started reading about the disruption and and these uh, impoverished ministers and so that led me to John Ferguson so yeah, yeah it was a very sort of serendipitous kind of almost magical uh route into the novel not, not at all a conscious decision to do one thing or another no and I find it so interesting that what kind of brought you to the story was language because I think what I found most interesting within the book was exploring the lack of a common language but in language and I'd written down to kind of ask you did the process of imagining what it must be like to not have a common language and to be so you know protective of your own language can make you consider the words you use every day and your own relationship with language? Mm -hmm. I think I and mean, I think what you need can't read this norm dictionary without being so um moved and captivated by the precision and nuance of the different words and you know there's a there's a scene in um in the novel where uh, uh john so he's trying slowly to to learn a little bit of Iwa's language just so that they can communicate in a pigeon mm -hmm. kind of way um and Iva is giving him all these different words for for the sea in its different states um, but the only definition John is able to write down is a rough sea because it just looks like a rough sea to him. So mm -hmm. what fascinated me was this idea of, um, you know, I think language is like bird song. You're, you know, it's a way of insiders communicating, but it's also a way of recognising who's an outsider. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's a sort of key into a way of seeing the world and that in many ways is what this story is about it's how John who doesn't really see the clearances as wrong he thinks mm -hmm. that landlords have every right to do what they want with their land but he's forced into this closer encounter with Ivor and through the language starts to see the world more through Ivor's eyes mm. and through the words I was interested to think about John. Where do you see, so as you've said already, John's a minister. Where do you see John's relationship with faith going towards the end of the book? Like, do you feel like there might be a loss of faith or an adjustment as to what faith might mean? Uh, I, it's important to me, actually, that, that John doesn't lose his faith. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler to, to say that. Um, but it's much more a question of... Um, you know, what, what does he do with that faith? Mm -hmm. And what relationship does faith have to do with a church? Um, so I, yeah, I don't want to give too much, too much away. No, no. But, um, but yeah, so it's, a, and actually, you know, he was, he was the most challenging character to write. I think it's mm -hmm. very difficult for a secular modern writer to, you know, go back 200 years and get inside the head of, um, a very religious person I mean there's there's obviously there's an awful lot of other things to John you know mm -hmm. he's very he's a man of his time but he's also you know he's, he's very anxious and he's kind of he's courageous in that he's made this decision to split away from the church given up his income but he's also you know quite timid and and cowardly um to the point that he's actually too afraid to tell Ivor why he's come, mm -hmm. which which causes um, all sorts of problems. He's kind of a man of his time that's not 
entirely comfortable being a man of his time, isn't he? Hmm, exactly. And, you know, he's, I suppose I sort of think of him as somebody who's, he's sort of wrapped in quite a lot of layers of <laughs> education and background and expectation. And um, one of the reasons I like, I mean, a, a lot of my books and short stories are set in these quite remote uh wild lonely places and um i th it sounds a little bit harsh but i i like putting my characters in those sorts of settings because mm -hmm. i think it's in those sorts of situations where life kind of the, the everyday kind of stuff of life it sort of falls away and you're left with something uh more elemental and and you're forced to look at um some really important things that that perhaps you would turn away from you know we're all very good at turning away from things and ignoring mm -hmm. things so yeah I think Mary also she is she's very layered isn't she and she in some ways she's of her time you know she wants to have a husband she wants to have this life she wants you know all these things she's been taught to expect hmm. but at the same time she's fairly I'm not going to say non-traditional, but by the end of the book and the situations that she finds herself in, she's very much just kind of looking at life and taking it as what it is without it needing to be within those those boundaries as to what you might expect. Yeah, she's, she's I think we could call her the ultimate pragmatist. Um, yeah. You know, she's, I mean, she is, she's very loving but she she actually she never expected to get married you know she's she's she was actually quite she she married doesn't marry John till she's in her 40s and what I love about Mary is that she's again like John she's she is of her time in that she doesn't have more power or agency than a woman of her time would have but within those strict confines she's incredibly brave and intrepid and decisive uh, I love that yeah, about her absolutely she is I agree I mean if you had to so it's obviously literary fiction but if you mm. had to more specifically pinhole clear into a genre mm. what it, do you think oh um well it has been called a thriller uh, okay. by, by quite a few critics because you know there is it is very tense and you know I, I my stories are my novels are they're they're quite short and there's mm -hmm. there's a um yeah there's a real tension tension I I can kind of as I write it I can I have to feel the tension you know the kind of pulling me through and pulling the reader through um so there you know there is a very strong sense of what is going to happen, you know, what's going to happen. There's, there's a mm -hmm. lot of danger. Like, um, in the horror genre, there's like a subgenre that you might have heard of called yeah. quiet horror. And it, okay. feels, it feels very fitting with this. So quiet horror is it kind of leads you along, but it's the language that's making you uneasy. And there's no, you know, big slashery events or any of that kind of thing. It's just no. a gentle no. trepidation. Yes, exactly. And I, I mean, I think there's always, um, I mean, th thriller I, th I think it's um I just think there's so much tension when you know you've got you've got uh, well I've got my small cast of characters three people and the reader gets inside each of their heads but each one doesn't know what the other one is thinking or planning mm -hmm. to do so the reader's kind of holding that but seeing the the actors if you like proceeding you know on their own path and that that creates a lot of tension yeah absolutely is what kind of what kind of genre do you read like what are you inspired to oh. by uh so I suppose I read well I read a lot of uh I read a lot of fiction by dead writers okay. you know or, you know like I, I mean I love even for somebody who writes tends to write very short books I I love the big 19th century novels so you know I love War and Peace I love Dickens I love George Eliot um I'm I'm reading Zadie Smith's The Fraud at the moment um, historical novel which I'm thoroughly enjoying you know she's so funny and intelligent and 
she's very political but she doesn't sort of beat you around the head so yeah. um yeah I'm enjoying that um I read uh, I read a lot of poetry as well mm. um and um so and I'm in a I'm in a book club it's a, actually a zoom book club that oh, wow I started during the pandemic with some friends in America and it was partly inspired by the backlisted podcast mm -hmm. um you know where they just why the why have these books been forgotten they're so great and I've read so many great books through um through that book club we've done um a brilliant short book called Mrs Bridge by Evan Connell um we just read the prime of Miss Jean Brody um by Muriel Spark so um yeah that, um yeah, I read a mix a mix of things. No, that's all good. As long as you're reading a lot. Yeah, but probably not much. I mean, I'm not that much crime. My husband is a huge consumer of crime. So on um, and we share a Kindle account. So I'm always being, you know, people <laughs> say, you know, we recommend this for you. And I put past that and get back to. So yeah, just, that's yeah. a big step. I'm not sure I could just share a Kindle account with anyone. <laughs> it's very personal, doesn't it? <laughs> what are your tips for if somebody wants to write what are your tips for just sitting down writing writing your first short story or a novel what are you saying well well sitting down is a very good tip mm -hmm. you know nothing's going to happen until you you know sit down and I you know I'd say go to your you know go to your desk every day that you can whenever you can and um I would say my really my biggest tip is don't worry if you feel afraid or that mm -hmm. if you feel you can't pull something off. I, in my own experience, those are always the best stories. Things that you think, oh my God, what, what am I even thinking? You know, sort of uh, a story set in 1843 on a remote Scottish island. I can't <laughs> write that. You know, I think that's a very good feeling to have. And you just, um, you know, it means there's something there, something worth pursuing. Um and I would also say, you know, keep absolutely everything because very often you'll write something and you'll think, oh, that's terrible. And then you go back to it two weeks later and you realise actually it, it isn't. There's a sort of freshness about it. So um, and you can, you know, you can spoil things by just going over and over and over and over writing them. Yeah, brilliant. Really good tips. Thank you. Okay, so are you allowed to tell us what you're working on next? Have you got anything else uh, interesting? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to tell you anything about it, no, because I just, I, I'm so superstitious about, you know, nothing is done till it's done and things can go, you know, go wrong along the way. But I'm I'm thinking about, two, I've got two ideas I'm sort of juggling with at the moment, which is usually what I do. I usually have more than one thing at, on at the go, uh, mm -hmm. on the go. I find that's, they kind of feed off each other and um and eventually one of them emerges as as the, the the one and then I pursue that one but um but no I'm 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 very secretive until <laughs> until I'm not <laughs> <laughs> that's not a problem at all okay so just before we go my colleague um Zuzia who she ran your read along for you so she was the first one on the team to read your book and has recommended it to all of us um has messaged me said just tell her thank you for the gift of this book to humanity oh well, that's lovely that's <laughs> lovely well I I really loved writing it and I really did and I um i very fond of all these three characters um you know I think quite often you'll you know you'll have one that you enjoy being with more than another but I was always glad to sort of shift between all three of them yeah it's a really special book well thank you for chatting to us Karis um as thank I said you. earlier Clear by Karis Davis is out by Granton now thank you